Scramble by I Had Him on the Robes, Carter Reed, and Rory Garmati, Rose Tinted Days. Chapter 8, Day 537. I misses you, you know. It had been too many days to count, see, nine, since he'd stumbled home, numb with too much emotion, and let Alfred wrap him in blankets and make him enough cocoa with marshmallows to last a lifetime. The moments had felt blurred, disbelief overlaying each rising sense of rage or despair or cruel, crippling irony that his manufactured monster could see or earn the romantic overtures of his soulmate while Bruce Wayne, the desperate boy buried inside still screaming for his parents, was little more than any inconvenience. It was only the following morning when the haze began to lift from his mind and, while still a little foggy and heavy, his thoughts began to string a little clearer, his memory sharper, his focus blunted, but far from useless, picked up on something that hurt more than Clark's inadvertent confession. Alfred felt guilty. And it wasn't fleeting, nor an itch he couldn't quite scratch. It burned inside him. The Brit had tightened down every emotion he had, clearly afraid that he was going to lose all of them should one get free. The billionaire, clad in an old, worn, soft jumper, cotton pants, and woolen socks with a blanket draped over his shoulders, had confronted him as the man putted about making yet more hot chocolate. Master Bruce, had I not insisted? He had said, brow drawn together, lower lip quivering just enough to show he was holding back tears while his eyes kept straying to his movements, too practiced to require attention but a helpful distraction from his ward's gaze. Bruce had stood, stock still, stunned at the revelation, before shaking his head with enough force that he might have loosened his teeth had Alfred not made a wounded sound at the action. No, the billionaire had spat fire bleeding into his tone. You are not responsible for this, Alfred. He'd taken a deep breath, breathing out his assurances as thoroughly and as clearly as he could, repeating over and over the Clark's affection and Diana's meddling weren't on Alfred, and the man should stop making himself sick with worry. You just wanted someone to have my back, Alfred. And they did. And you were right, sometimes even Batman needs friends. Not them! Alfred had replied quickly, loyalty to Bruce like a wrecking ball through whatever respect Clark and the others might have gained with their successful alliance with and protection of the Bats. And that was the last they had spoken of the League, both apparently content to move on and draw a firm, thick line underneath it, to preserve not only Bruce's sanity but Alfred's too. They were, after all, the only people they each had left in the world. With that, Bruce had returned to his life before the League, scrambling across the rooftops of Gotham and throwing himself through windows, inspiring equal parts dread and hope, with little thought to the group of spandex-glad supers lingering on the edges of the city limits, clearly eager to enter but fearful enough of his wrath not to venture over that line. It would be amusing if the heavy layered hesitation wasn't so palpable and set Bruce's teeth on edge. The day had been blisteringly long, filled with too much social interaction, board meetings, even with competent people, sucked, and already on five cups of coffee and four hours of sleep, by the time 2 a.m. rolled around, Bruce just wanted to stop, particularly after breaking up three armed robberies, a mugging, an attempted stabbing, an attempted sexual assault, and no less than nine drug deals, the dealers all of whom were attempting trying to shift Scarecrow's latest batch of hallucinogenic narcotics. He'd practically thrown his evidence and suspected Gordon before vanishing into the closest shadow and letting it carry him towards the cave. The bat, fearsome reputation or not, was ready to turn in, even if he did have an hour's patrol left. Aqua man, it seemed, didn't get the memo. Batman? He'd greeted, tone both hesitant and happy, as he'd landed heavily enough on the roof to crack the stone. Bruce sighed, keeping his gaze out on Gotham, using her streets as a buffer to ignore his rooftop companion. You won't answer in your communicator, Arthur continued softly, seating himself on the ledge beside the bat and swinging his legs over the side. It's currently at the bottom of Gotham Harbor, Bruce replied, speaking the first sentence to one of the Justice League since the fight after the fight against the weaponers. Arthur laughed loud and childish before shrugging, as though he expected such an answer. 
and waving his trident around as though it weren't anything more than a cheap pointy steak. You know I could get that back for you, Roy. Bruce only hummed in reply. The mood turned suddenly serious, and Arthur tensed a little, clearly unsure as to how his words were to be received. Then, I misses you, you know? Bruce kept his silence. Arthur sighed, wedging the trident into a crack in the concrete of the roof before, Can't convince you to come back? An icy laugh forced its way through Bruce's lips. It's less complicated to work apart, he replied. Might be, Arthur said, knocking his shoulder against Bruce with a wink. But it's less fun. The half laugh that forced its way out surprised Bruce and Arthur too with the way he raised his eyebrows at the grunt choked off sound that the modulator made sound vaguely threatening. Fun? Bruce asked, tone regulating back to the same neutral he always saw to maintain. You know, you're the most fun league member in my book, right? I mean, who else is gonna outsmart the shit out of Hal? His ego is like. He held out his arms wide. That big now. I grin, it's been a week and he's already calling himself the team strategist, plus I mean Diana and Clark are great and all, but they can't plan for shit. They're both soldiers and we need a general. You're a king. Bruce shot back in an instant. Arthur laughed then. That's a whole bucket of crap I ain't getting into now, mates. He replied, I don't want that. Never did. But I got to for my people. And I get to call them as your people, but I just gotta say, are you really going to leave the defense of humankind to a group that aren't actually human? The Altaian knew he'd said the right thing when he didn't immediately get a response. He grinned, standing and tugging the trident free as he did, lazily spinning it in his hands. We well, all miss you, Bats, but you'll do what you'll do. If you need help, dip it down in the arbor and I'll come and give you a hand. The offer seemed genuine, and Bruce couldn't help but allow a faint, brief whisper of a smile to skitter across his lips. I'll keep an eye turned to the tide. He offered with a nod, white lenses pinned to his face. Arthur laughed, unfazed. Got it off? See you around, bats. He offered before jumping off the roof and disappearing into the damp murk of Gotham, clearly content to quit well ahead. But the words wedged themselves deep into Bruce's bones and somehow rather than stand, shoot off his grappling hook and swing away towards the manor as he so desperately wanted to. He heaved in a deep sigh and fished out the burner phone he'd given to Clark all those months ago. It was encrypted like the one he gave Diana and he'd given it to Clark when they'd first become friends. Bruce told himself it was a gesture of good faith on his part, as well as a giant hurdle to leap in dealing with his lingering, smarting rejection. And Superman had taken the emergencies only to heart. That was, of course, until a few weeks later, when a close call saw the Metropolis hero smash into the earth at God knows what speed after being knocked out of the sky. When he didn't immediately get up, Bruce's heart had stalled him and the cameras cut and it skipped so Bruce turned to their emergency-only phone and sent a simple, You better not be done, Cal. It had been enough. Their conversations were stilted and disjointed, dragged across weeks and days. Their Bruce's replies only coming when they, Bruce, looked at the phone or concluded when they'd seen each other at Watchtower. It was simple, too. Their correspondence reading like a series of random half-thoughts and bad responses. I tried enchiladas for the first time today. I don't like enchiladas. Pistachio ice cream is better in Italy. Of course it is, Cal. I can say hello and goodbye and thank you and you're welcome in Japanese now. Japanese people are lovely, Bee. Have you been? Once. I've only been a few times. They have a lot of bad weather here. You probably know that. I saved a man who was walking his toddler on a child leash today, Bee. I thought leashes were for dogs. I'm pretty sure they're called child reigns. They're weird. Jimmy finally got a photo of Superman yesterday. He must be proud. Maybe he can delete the nine he has of Superman eating buffalo wings. I'm not even going to ask how you know about those pictures. Bruce scrolled down to their most recent correspondence. Lois has a new boyfriend already. Jimmy told me. Apparently he's a football coach. What a step down. Thanks, B. Apparently he went to Gotham U. A Gotham City guy in Lois? I laughed at the irony. Is it terrible to wonder if she ever cared about me? They'd shared enough Ben and Jerry's ice cream to cover that last one that Bruce never wanted to eat pretzel balooza ever again. Ironically, the other two flavors in the ice box had been a super mango berry belief. 
because of course Clark had a B.O.J. flavor named after him, and Wayne Tastic Watermelon. He'd said he liked the watermelon flavored gelato in one interview. One! Bruce heaved out a sigh and typed, Cal, Gotham, we should talk. It took even less time than he was expecting. Okay, B, give me five. Clark was there in four. Clark looked not good. A little tired around the edges, maybe. Something that wasn't helped by the scruffy state of his shirt, hair, and the lopsided slant of his glasses. It was a little jarring to see Clark as Clark, rather than as the pinnacle of truth, justice, and the American dream he so regularly was, particularly when stood opposite Batman on a Gotham rooftop. The Kryptonian clearly picked up Batman's concern. I was finishing an article for Perry, he explained, hand making a feeble gesture behind him. No one will see me, he added, tossing the words into the silence where they seemed to be swallowed all. I know, Bruce replied, because he did. He also took a moment to enjoy how seeing Clark didn't conjure up anything stronger than hesitation and mild nerves. Perhaps he was more tired than he realized. So you want to... Uh, talk? The billionaire winced and knew it must have translated poorly onto Batman's face if the expression Clark responded with was any indication. Diana spoke to you. A blush tainted Clark's cheeks. She mentioned she'd said some uh, things. His eyes darted around, landing anywhere but on Bruce. About, uh, me. And about, uh, you. She did. Bruce nodded slowly. You didn't react well, Clark muttered, shoulders dropping a bit. I was blindsided, the older man confessed. I didn't see it. World's greatest detective, eh? The alien quibbed, tone touching on bitter for a moment. Bruce ignored it. It can't be. He grit out, astounded that this, this was his life. You know that, right, Cal? P. I. I... Clark. Bruce said firmly, switching tactics. This cannot be. And rest assured that the things Diana mentioned can simply fade away on their own. There was a heavy silence. One where Clark stood tall, squared his shoulders, and jut his chin out as though Bruce had just issued him a challenge. What if I don't want them to fade away? He replied, tone every inch Superman. Bruce offered a wry smile. Why wouldn't you? That <laughs> threw the man of steel. He opened his mouth, then closed it again, before setting his jaw stubbornly. I'm not fishing, Cal, but you and Lois have just separated weeks ago, and she's moved on, he protested. And this is not real. This is you latching on to someone near you so you don't have to deal with why you ended things with Lois. B, I know my feelings. I know... And I have just told you mine, Cal, Bruce replied, swallowing down the rising anger. This cannot be. Will not be. The man seemed to deflate like a balloon, all thigh hissing away in an instant. Is... is this... B because of your soulmate? He finally forced out, voice a little unsteady. You... you said you didn't... Have one! And for the first time, Bruce went with complete honesty. Yes, it is about my soulmate. I know them, Cal. They're a part of my life. And after I met them, I burnt off my words because Batman cannot be weighed down by soulmates. Batman cannot be compromised in such a way. And Gotham will always come first. It was the best, most practical decision to preserve my life as it is to remove such a thing. He didn't realize he'd been shouting until his voice cracked. Clark was pale, quiet and still and pale, eyes flicking down to his ribs were the words he purged at once lane. Bruce's skin screamed. You... you burned them? He whispered in a paper-thin, deathly quiet voice. I, di I didn't want them anymore. Batman growled out. And the chasm that existed between them was suddenly there for all to see. I'm sorry, Clint whispered, eyes wet. And when and he started crying, Bruce sighed, shaking his head. I don't want your apologies, Cal. I just want this to stop. 
quiet, then, okay, almost lost on the wind as the alien dressed as a man rose slowly into the air until he hovered above like a messiah returned from the skies. Okay, B. Okay, he repeated, voice wobbling enough to betray his effort in keeping it level. Things will g go back to the way they were. With that, Clark was gone. And despite the fatigue gnawing at his bones, despite the knowledge that he'd achieved exactly what he wanted with Clark, despite a perverse sense of satisfaction watching Clark crumple with rejection the way Batman had all those months ago, by the time Bruce finally dragged his weary body to bed, he found he couldn't sleep at all, and the only sight behind his lids were the tears that had tracked his soulmate's cheeks. <laughs>